Hello YouTubers, um, I'm here to talk about something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue challenge um, that I decided to do, I believe it was probably sometime in the middle of March. The challenge was hosted by uh, Bitten by Book Lust channel, her name is Blair, and um, I, I don't know how many other people uh, decided to do the challenge on today's April 30th, which was supposed to be the last day. Um, I'd have to say I only got through three books and I started on the fourth. So um, it was sort of a fail for me, but I'm going to continue to read the fourth book anyway since uh, I started it and I want to get, I want to read it. So the first book that I read for the old is The Trees by Conrad Richter. And uh, this is a pretty cool, although old, <laughs> book cover. Um, it's kind of got some damage to it, it, but it's in pretty good shape. It has uh, the, the deckle edge on it. And if you take off um, the book cover, which I got to do very, very, very carefully, um, the book itself uh, cover is cloth and it is really really kind of neat you can see there's some marks and stuff on it but um, yeah uh, this book was published uh, in 1940 and um, there is the pu I do not know whether it's just a first edition I think it might be but there is the date right there and um, so I'm thinking this might be a first edition or somewhere there's about. Uh, the printing wasn't really too bad, had wide margins. Uh, I really enjoyed this book. Of course, Conrad Richter, whether you know or not, is a or was a, a pretty famous author um, and wrote, I believe, three books to this one. There's The Trees, uh, The Fields, and The Town, which I believe is probably the most famous of the three books, the last one. Who knew? So anyway, this book is about a family. You can see there, uh, there's um, his name, oh, Wyatt. <laughs> well, I'm kind of thinking, I read this book several weeks ago, so you'll have to forgive me. That this, his name was Luckett, a Worth, Worth Luckett. Luckett was the, the last name of the family. Uh, Jerry was his wife. And then there's the kids, Jenny, Wyatt, Asha, and Suli. Um, and Sayward is, is, another, is another one of the children. Um, basically, this family um, lived in Pennsylvania. And I'm going to have to say this was probably somewhere, somewhere 1780s, 1790s. And they, they were in Pennsylvania probably near the Ohio border, and they ran out of food. They were, uh, um, Wyatt, I can't, think of, I can't think of his name. His name keeps going, and he is really th Worth, I keep saying Wyatt. Worth, who was the father, was a hunter, and that's how they got their food, basically. So when the food in the forests ran out where they lived in Pennsylvania, he decided to move the family to Ohio, so they had to cross the Ohio River and um, move into the, into like, I would assume the Southern Ohio area, which was basically nothing but forest at that time. Um, and when they reached like a pinnacle, I remember them talking when they first went into Ohio, they reached like a, like a hill or a high area where they could see over the trees. And all they saw was just trees, trees, trees. They saw no clearings, no, it was amazingly, dense forest for as far as they could see. So uh, they went into this forest uh, and when they first got there you know it was a, a little spooky. Uh, they started to get used to it um, and he the father found a spot and the mother was not real happy about it but there was like a, a stream or a brook that went through there and uh, so there was water and uh, the father Worth had said that um, this would be a good place because he, he saw like where animals would come and drink water. So he knew there were animals around that he could hunt. 
Um, this is the way they just made their living, his, his living back there. They, he would obviously um, take the hides and sell them as well as if he had too much or you know, too much meat, he would sell the meat also. So this is how they made an income. They ate very little uh, vegetable matter. Um, and obviously in a forest like this, there was very little uh, vegetable matter to eat. So almost everything was, was meat. And they eventually started getting very, very tired of just meat. They were able to get grain. There was like a town, a very, very small trading kind of a town, um, several miles away, uh, that the father eventually did go and get a bag of grain for them. Um, the Indians at the time were, well, <laughs> but uh, they would just like come up to, he, he built a, a cabin in this area, and they would just walk in um, sit down in front of the fire and uh, just stay whenever they wanted to. Uh, it was just a very strange, um, strange, strange thing. <laughs> so, but that's just the way I guess it was back then. Um, and uh, so he had to, of course, develop a relationship with several of the Indians. So he couldn't really, you know, tell them to get out of his house and stuff like that because he needed, he needed their help. Uh, but it was a very interesting story. Um, I, I don't know how much to give away because I'm not sure you guys would actually want to read it. It's, it is an old, obviously an old story. And some of the writing style is a bit dated, but not really too bad. Um, they do talk in the slang of the day. So if you've read Huckleberry Finn, you will understand what I mean. So when they converse, in, uh, it is with, with, with a rather heavy slang, but it, you can understand what they're talking about, unless, of course, they talk about um, uh, items and things and objects that we wouldn't be familiar with. But in any case, um, there's a lot that happens in this book, uh, a lot of very, very hard times. Um, the children um, eventually end up living by themselves. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say how all that happens. But eventually the father takes off the uh, couple of the children. Um, uh, don't make it through the novel. I don't think that's unusual for that time period, especially living in the woods like that. Um, but a few of them do make it through. Some of them have some very difficult times with uh, one of the daughters marries uh, another really strange woodsman type person, a hunter also. Um, and I will say this, but that hunter ends up leaving that daughter and going with the, another one of the daughters and actually taking off and um, leaving the first, leaving his wife, in essence, back in this home alone in the forest. And this is a strong female lead novel, so if you like strong female leads, this one is it. Uh, Sayward is the one who makes it through. She uh, are, makes it probably the best. She's a very, very strong teenager. I think we first see her, she's around 15 years old, um, when, when they arrive at, at this part of the forest. And the story really is about her. Um, and she makes it through to the end of the book. And um, I'm not going to say what happens to her. Um, but really fairly good things happen to her. Um, and she, uh, she is going to be the one who is going to be in the next book, which is The Field. So she's the character that carries on through. I'm not sure that we're done seeing all of the characters in the book. Uh, as far as her brothers and sisters, I think they will show up. In the other books too and I, I really do want to read them but I do recommend The Trees by Conrad Richter. There was one scene in it that um, was a chilling scene. Um, it made my skin crawl when this this scene happened. It involved an, an animal. Uh, they did not have uh, respect for animals back then. You've got to remember that animals to them were food. Animals were clothing. So uh, they didn't think of animals as, um, they were a part of nature, but they were a commodity. 
and uh, something happened with, a, with an animal and, uh, that made my skin, skin crawl. And this, this scene happened very, very quickly it, it, uh, and very unexpectedly. Um, but that was like the only scene that really bothered me. You know, of course, you know, they're, they're, they are killing animals and, and you know, uh, gutting them and doing things like that. But it isn't terribly gory or anything. Um, but this one scene uh, just was really, really nasty. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so that was my something old. My something new was Lauren Oliver's Delirium. And because I just am really a terrible reviewer, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this novel. I'm sure there's lots of reviews out on YouTube if you, if you want to see them. But in essence, it is the story of a girl. Well, I will, what I did is I just cut the video because I, I really am trying to think of a good way to describe, um, to describe this book and, and to review it. I'm just so really, really bad at it. And I really just don't have time to, to sit down here and think about how am I going to tell everybody about what happens in this book because so much happens. But in, in, in that sh what happens really is this girl, um, Lena, and she has a longer name than that. But uh, this girl, Lena, she um, is in this society where you basically have parts of your brain removed or um, cauterized or whatever. And it takes away your uh, very passionate feelings. Um, not just sexual love, for example, but passion for many things. Um, strong feelings uh, for art or strong feelings for strong emotions, I guess, is a good way to, to think about it. However, anger, the bad emotions are not part of it. It's only the good emotions that appear to... Um, be the, pro the the problem with what they do, but they say that love is 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 basically bad or or actual you know a strong attachment type love. So um, sh this happens uh, about when they're 18 years old. They have the surgery and they prepare these kids for this life after this um, surgery. Um, and her time is coming up, of course, and you know what's going to happen. She's going to fall in love right be just before all this is supposed to happen. So, yeah. But uh, her, her and a friend of hers are kind of mixed throughout the whole book, and then, of course, she meets the boy. And, uh, and the whole story, basically, is about uh, Alex, uh, Lena, and Hannah, her friend. Um, it gets all the way to the end, um, and there's sort of a cliffhanger at the end. I actually thought it was the closing of the book. Um, I think I did a little research on it, and I believe there's going to be a sequel, I hope, because there was this cliffhanger at the end. I did not like the way it ended, so I will tell you that now. I personally did not like the way it ended. Um, you, you went through all this with these people, and then, I don't know. I can't really tell you how the ending is, but I didn't like the way it ended. Uh, so, but I enjoyed the book immensely, and of course I will read the sequel when it comes out. My Something Borrowed was Beg, Borrow, Steal, A Writer's Life um, by Michael Greenberg. And I was supposed to read a book that was a borrowed book, like a library book or something, but I decided to uh, actually get a book that had the word borrow in the title. There's not very many of those. <laughs> so, um, this was a book I just finished, um, and it is basically sort of a memoir. He actually published another book, which is his personal memoir. But these are stories that were published in... Yeah, the stories in this book appeared in an earlier form in the author's freelance column in the Times Literary Supplement between June 2003 and April 2009. So they are basically just short uh, chapter type things. Um, and each one is just a little bit of, of things that happened in his life that kind of affect, affects his writing. Um, they talk, he talks about his father, um, uh, one of his children in this book. He talks about um, people that he has met, uh, places that he rented um, to write in. 
um, just all different kinds of things, and I really enjoyed it. You know, it's not it's not one of those books that it's a page turner or anything like that, but they're just little essays, if you will, of things that happened throughout his life. There's a good one about the subway. There's a good one about uh, the rats in New York. Um, just all kinds of little bits and pieces. So um, I would recommend it. It it um, if you just enjoyed um, kind of little stories and essays about people's lives and, and kind of what shapes them, this would be a, a book for that. Um, the fourth book, which was a fail, I guess you could say, um, is the one I just started uh, a couple days ago, and that is Ship of the Line. i got to put on my old people's glasses here. Ship of the Line by C.S. Forrester. Um, this is a book, this is the Horatio Hornblower series. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. There have been, this is obviously one of my Easton Press books, and um, I bought the entire series. There was 11 books in this series. Um, I've read the first one, which is called Beat to Quarters, and this is the second book in the series, um, Ship of the Line. Not a terribly long book, uh, 292 pages, and the print is rather, um, rather normal, I'd say. Um, and it's a pretty fast read. They do talk a lot about ships, obviously. These were written, um, I believe the actual 1938 was when the book was actually written. And so the series starts in the 30s and goes all the way through into the 50s, I believe, the, the 11 books. Um, so they are, you know, a modern English, but they talk about ships uh, back in, I believe these are in the 1700s. Now, I'm, it's just completely skipping my mind that I've got this camera on me. But, uh, so these were things that happened, um, yeah, oh, May 1810. 17 years deep into the Napoleonic Wars, Captain Horatio Hornblower is newly in command of his first ship of the line. The 74-gun HMS Sutherland, which he deems the ugliest and least desirable two-decker in the Navy list. Moreover, she is 250 men short of a full crew, so Hornblower must entrain, enlist and train poachers, bigamists, and sheep stealers. And that's really true because they started um, just the very first uh, few pages. He starts off, he's the one who's got to try to find all these men to, to uh, get this, this ship out. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a ship of war uh, out. It's a Dutch ship, and um, it's shaped kind of strange. Um, he likes English ships, of course, because this is, this is about Britain. Um, and uh, so he, they have this Dutch ship of... Uh, actually, I'm not sure if it was a warship, but the English captured it. Or I'm not remember, I don't remember exactly how they got the ship, but uh, they've turned it over into a warship. Um, so, he was put in command of this ship, and now he's got to find people to man it, and uh, 250 people is a lot of people to try to find. So, um, I'm enjoying it already. I, I enjoyed the first book. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of adventure um, on the high seas in, in that time period. If you enjoy, it, it, it's historical to a point, but it is more about the adventure than it is about the history. So um, if you enjoy that kind of reading, then I definitely recommend um, the Horatio Hornblower. I believe they also made um, a, like a TV miniseries out of it, um, uh, possibly the BBC did. So in any way, um, that is my something borrowed, uh, something gold, something new, something borrowed, something blue fail, because it is the end of the month and I wanted to get the video out there. So there you are. I'm going to continue to read, uh, finish uh, Ship of the Line, even though I didn't quite get it done for the challenge. So sorry, Blair. Um, I made an attempt at it. Um, so I will uh, talk to all you later. And um, I think that's it. Bye.